So, um, first of all, uh, thank you very, very much indeed for the invitation to speak today. It's a real treat. Um, and uh, the only uh, silver lining I can think of uh, to the pandemic is the uh, wonderful opportunity to to get to hang out with colleagues virtually and see names in the participant list that um, whose work I admire and company I enjoy. And uh, it's good to have this form of community. So uh, let's see. Like some of the people in the audience I know, I am fascinated with the question of how you build an animal. And uh, probably we all are fascinated by that problem at some level. Um, what you're seeing on the screen, of course, is uh, ventral furrow formation and convergent extension in the Drosophila embryo. And the reason I like to show this is because it is beautiful. It's intensely studied and it illustrates the point that development for all of its amazing complexity is amazingly reproducible. So we should be able to understand how this works. Now, what I'll be talking about today is one particular part of this big, wonderful, beautiful question, which is, let's see, there we go. How does a cell know to make these contractile bands of actin and myosin that run vertically on the screen up and down and that generate the contractile force that both drives um, the movement of cells into the interior of the animal to make the internal organs and along the length of the animal in order to set up the anterior posterior axis. So we know that those contractile bands are made out of actin and myosin, and we know quite a lot about that. So we know that myosin uh, produces force by uh, pulling on actin and that intrinsically the force that myosin produces uh, translocates the myosin bundle from the pointed end of the actin filament towards the barbed end or minus and plus. And that uh, equivalently, that means that the actin feels a force as if the myosin were pulling towards the, the pointed end of the filament. We know that the system self assembles, as I've shown, actually, I should figure out how to, well, uh, we know that the system self-assembles into sarcomeric bands as shown here in this uh, fibroblast. And then of course, in this cardiomyocyte, uh, alternating stripes of actin and myosin. Now that these things exist, the question is always in biology is how? How do you go from a nanometer size molecule up to cellular level organization as I've shown here or supercellular organization in the case of an organism. And I'll talk today about how single molecule biophysics experiments have unexpectedly, or at least unexpectedly by me, given us um, some insight into how this remarkable process of assembly across scales may occur. Okay. So, to, to sharpen up that question, we can ask ourselves, how are these contractile bands that span cells assembled precisely when and where they're required to drive uh, tissue elongation? And in particular, I won't be talking so much about how the actomyosin stripes self-assemble, although that question is of considerable interest. I'll be talking about how you set the pattern up because even if you have such a cable, you have to somehow get the barbed ends of the actin filaments tied down at the right place at the right time. And it's not so simple to imagine how one might do that, right? Um, that's the beauty of this problem, I think, is that the molecular self-assembly has to be encoded in the properties of dumb molecules. There's no top-down organization. So how do we get those plus ends where they're supposed to be? Now, those of you who, who know me have known that my lab has spent a fair amount of energy studying uh, cell adhesion biology. 
And the reason that I like this problem is that these connections between cells, so for example, cell-cell contacts mediated by e cadherin and cell ECM contacts mediated by, um, there we go, uh, integrins are really what sets up an animal. This is what differentiates us from, say, an amoeba. And so therefore, it's a, of intrinsic interest to me to understand how these adhesion complexes work. Now, as far as parts go, I'd like you to notice uh, alpha catenin, shown here in red, and vinculin, and then uh, tailin. Those are the three molecules we'll most be talking about. And each of them uh, play a role in physically linking cell adhesion molecules to F-actin, shown here as these cables. And all the work I'll be telling you about today is done by three very talented and enterprising graduate students, Derek, Nick, and Leanna, and is done in close collaboration with my uh, friend and colleague, Bill Weiss, who's also at Stanford. Now I'll set up the problem by describing some published work on vinculin. And uh, for those of you who may have seen the study, just bear with me, it's easier to introduce the technique uh, this way. Now vinculin, uh, connects both cadherin-based and integrin-based adhesions to F-actin. And the vinculin null mass shows these really provocative defects in heart development and neural tube closure, both processes that require long-range force transmission through tissues. Now, we didn't set out to understand its role in development. We asked a simple reductionist question, which is how does force affect the vinculin-actin bond and then in so doing, we derived insight into how vinculin may help to organize F-actin. Now, the way this assay works is that we have two optically trapped beads here and here um, with an F-actin filament stretched in between them. And then a microscope cover slip sparsely decorated with beads that are stuck down and uh, those in turn sparsely decorated with vinculin shown here in blue. Now the stage moves back and forth in a square wave, as shown here. And then when vinculin binds onto the F-actin filament, one of the two trapped beads gets pulled out of the trap, as shown in this force trace. And we can watch that bead relax back into the center of the trap in a series of jumps, each jump corresponding to a complex letting go. And we can record many such binding interactions uh, for a given uh, platform is shown here. Now, what you'll immediately, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just a cold, I live with a toddler. Uh, everybody's got a negative test. Also, this is over the internet, so you all have nothing to fear anyway. Um, so when we zoom in on this, we immediately noticed a directional bias where the events in the down direction seem to last much longer than the events in the up direction. And um, I don't have time to go through the details, but we used an assay where we determined the polarity of individual F-actin filaments using myosin-6, which uh, is a myosin-directed uh, motor, in order to determine that the long events correspond to when force is directed towards the minus end of the actin filament. Now remember uh, that non-muscle myosin 2, uh, in effect, pulls in the same direction. So it is the, the major non-muscle myosin in cells is pulling on F actin such that it experiences flow directed towards the pointed end. Now we can model that behavior of this vinculin uh, in the following way. So all models are wrong, some are useful. This one is uh, adequate to describe the data. We say that vinculin binds to F-actin in two states, a weak binding state, one, a strong binding state, two, and then of course, unbound. And what we find is that mechanical force stabilizes the strong binding state and in consequence, the binding lifetime of vinculin for F-actin increases about 100-fold 
as you go from a uh, negligible force to about eight piconewtons of load. Now, so that's cool. The second thing that we learn from this is that there is this really remarkable asymmetry. When you're pulling on the F actin in one direction, it grabs on tightly. When you're pulling in the other direction, it uh, grabs on about a factor of 10 uh, more weakly. And we'll get to what that may mean in a moment. So at the time when we published that paper, we were mostly thinking about cell migration. And this sort of strategy provides the cell with a really cool way to set up polarity in the F actin filaments. Whereas the cells migrate, filaments that are oriented with their barbed ends out, as shown here and here, get snagged by vinculin at cell adhesion complexes. Filaments that are oriented the wrong way around, like this one, just flow on past. And so we propose that this is a way to set up a long range organization in cells in order to drive directed migration. And uh, this is consistent uh, with some cell biological data that I didn't have time to talk about. Now, the resulting feedback loop is that uh, as these filaments catch stochastically on these adhesions, uh, they in turn can generate more tension. That in turn helps orient and organize the F-actin and potentially uh, anchor F-actin bundles. So that was all satisfying. Some of my colleagues, uh, when we published this paper, were, were curious to know if this was a one-off or if this was like uh, a real thing, basically. Is this just some vinculin thing or is this something that really is meaningful in terms of its biology? So naturally, we were curious to know that too. And one way of doing that is to simply look at other adhesion proteins. So uh, this work is up on BioArchive. Um, I'd encourage you to take a look and give me some feedback on this work. So we did a logical thing, which was just to look at talon. So talon is another molecule that links uh, cell integrin adhesions to F-actin. Talon has three actin binding sites and up to 11 vinculin binding sites. So it's really set up to potentially make ridiculously stable bonds to F-actin. But interestingly, none of the None of Talon's F actin binding sites had been examined under load. So, what we chose to focus on was the third actin binding site, ABS3, which also dimerizes Talon. So, it's shown here in light blue. Now, when you uh, mess with the F actin binding activity of this domain, so in this Talon ABS3 mutant, uh, Germ band extension, sort of okay, but muscle attachment and dorsal closure is a wreck. So these are some very unhappy flies. So it's good for something. Now, what we noticed in the literature is that mammalian uh, tail and ABS3 is a terrible actin binder. Like this is about as lousy an actin binder as I'm aware of. Uh, so you can see that even at like 40 or 50 micromolar F actin, uh, you're still not even saturating its binding. This is, I believe, data from the Critchley lab. So what's the point of an F actin binder that doesn't bind F actin? Well, we repeated the assay that I just introduced in the context of that published vinculin study. But this time there's a little twist, which is of course, we're very curious to know if the dimerization activity of this protein fragment plays any role in binding. Now, here's what we see. What we see is that just like vinculin, uh, the binding is absurdly directional, but uh, in this case, we get more like a thousand fold binding enhancement under load when load is directed in the minus n direction and we can't even saturate it. So the actin filaments begin snapping much past about 15 piconewtons. And you can see the force or the stability of the bond is still going up. We get uh, these quite ludicrous uh, binding lifetimes of like hundreds of seconds made the assay rather painful, which is why I'm showing a like 
moving average rather than a uh, model fit is that it just took <laughs> it takes you know literally 10 times as long to collect this data as the vinculin data for that reason and um then okay so first off this directionality appears to be something that happens in more than one f active binding protein okay that's good now th the question is and it, as I just said in words, it's pretty remarkable as compared to the directionality and binding lifetime shown by Vinculin. Now, um, oh, I cut that from the talk. I'll just say in words. Um, you can read about this on BioArchive. Dimerization is definitely required for this long-lived binding activity. Now, um, for the last bit of my talk, I'll talk about some new results on alpha catenin. The lab has studied this protein for some time. Uh, we reported in 2014 that it forms a catch bond with f actin, but we did not examine its directional preferences. So before I get into that, I'll remind you that this protein, or in this assay, we uh, often see more than one complex binding at once, and that gives us the opportunity to watch the sequential unbinding of complexes. That will become relevant in just a bit. Now, all the data that I've shown you so far have been for this last step here. Um, reasoning that this last step in the sequence corresponds to the unbinding of a single last bound complex. When we look at that, first off, we uh, see some modest directionality in the complex, so about a twofold preference for uh, binding when force is oriented towards the negative end of the filament. And this is consistent with another report from another group that's been posted on BioArchive. Um, now, we were curious. So, I've mentioned that tailin and alpha catenin both recruit vinculin. Okay. What does vinculin binding do to the f actin binding activity of alpha catenin itself? In order to examine that question, we added to our assay just the vinculin head box here in yellow. This part of vinculin doesn't have any f actin binding activity. And so what we're looking is to see if vinculin acts as an allosteric modifier of the f actin binding by alpha catenin. And quite surprisingly to us, the interesting part of this story comes not in the behavior of one complex, but in several complexes. And I'll show you what I mean. So for filaments with load oriented in the negative direction, we see that the binding lifetime for the ternary complex is roughly constant as a function of step number. So this step number on average is the same as lifetime on average as this one and this one and this one. So fifth from last, fourth for last, third from last, second from last, all about the same. Statistically, it actually goes down slightly um, because on average, these earlier steps are under a bit more load. When we add the vinculin head, we see a very different behavior. We actually see that the binding lifetimes go up with a uh, complex number. Now, when we check in the positive direction, we see no such effect. What this is telling us, and I'm um, happy to discuss our, our current thinking on it, is that the vinculin binding is acting as an allosteric uh, modifier for how multiple cadherin catenin complexes interact with a single f actin filament. And it's doing so in a way that reinforces f actin binding selectively when multiple complexes are bound to a filament being pulled on uh, from the negative direction. All right, so it's time to wrap up. What we've seen here is one mechanism uh, by which cells may um, organize f actin both within cells and across cells. We've seen that vinculin, for example, and tailin, not shown here, 
show a very strong directional preference for f actin stabilization. They selectively anchor f actin that's being pulled on by non muscle myosin 2, at least in a directional sense, and they only do so under load. Further, we've seen that the cadherin catenin complex shows some directionality that's rather modest, and that vinculin can amplify this directionality in two distinct ways. The first is by its own directional F actin binding, and the second is by uh, a positive feedback loop, where, wherein as tension increases, more complexes are recruited, and those complexes themselves interact allosterically in order to further stabilize um, F actin that's oriented in the correct direction. Now, the result uh, in our model is that these contractile F actin cables can assemble precisely where and when they are needed. So they only assemble where they can bear load between cells. And in so doing, in response to the proper developmental cues, you can self-assemble in a bottom-up way contractile F actin arrays that span across multiple cells to drive uh, tissue morphogenesis. Now, um, Leanna's work on Talon uh, suggests that the Talon ABS3, this little tiny fragment of a rather large molecule, has some really cool properties. So we find that it will only bind F actin if the F actin is oriented in the correct direction, if it's under load, if Talon can dimerize, and of course, if the integrins that Talon are attached to uh, are in, in fact attached to load bearing ECM. So the idea is that uh, this set of properties um, may potentially help to constrain focal adhesion growth to precisely where and when it's required in order for the cell to grab onto and pull on its surroundings. Now, I've shown you that three proteins show this directional F actin binding. As it happens, they all have homologous F actin binding domains. So we can at least say with some confidence that, that this may be a property of what's so-called batch domain. Uh, what we don't know is how uh, load may affect the uh, binding of other uh, F actin binders. And in, partic in particular, we know nothing about uh, how load can act as an organizer uh, in other circumstances. Nevertheless, uh, it's uh, fun to hypothesize that these sorts of directional uh, interactions may serve as a ubiquitous means of organizing cells and tissues. So uh, that, of course, remains to be tested. Now, I've acknowledged the students who did the work, Leanna, Nick, and Derek. Uh, funding is listed here. I should mention again my collaborator, Bill, whose expertise in structural biology and biochemistry makes all of this single molecule stuff uh, fun and, and easy sometimes. Uh, <laughs> And uh, again, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present this work. And uh, I would love to hear any questions or feedback. OK, great. Thanks, Alex, for a really clear talk. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of questions from the chat. So the first one is from uh, Robine Brownsma, who asked early on if the asymmetry you measure depends on the rate at which the, you pull. And I might extend that to are there other features of how you do the experiment that influence it? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Um, easy to address in modeling, not quite so simple for us to address experimentally yet. So the way that we set up the experiment in order to make the, the data analysis relatively more easily is that the loading is as quick as we can manage. Now, to get to your question more directly,
the asymmetry, at least in my head, uh, should persist regardless of loading rate. What tends to happen at lower loading rates is you decrease the likelihood of, of falling into that strong bound state. So the complex has to try many, many, many more times before it actually catches and holds. And that's something that we've addressed in modeling and un unpublished work on the consequences for um, how cell cell junctions grow. But we have no data. Uh, and your question is reminding me that we really ought to. So thank you for that. I, I specifically was interested if that the energy barrier moving to the right mm -hmm. and to the left, in fact, should be exactly the same. Um, so uh, the asymmetry should persist, but if you go to lower and lower loading rates, you should see weaker, mm -hmm. weaker forces until it's zero in both directions. Uh, the energy the barrier. Sorry, the, the force becomes yeah. weaker, but the work you do to move it on the bump mm -hmm. to the right and to the left should be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Because it's an, you may have a sawtooth set of energy barriers, but the energy barrier mm -hmm. must remain the same. It just means that mm -hmm. you apply a weaker force over a longer distance. So I think that we're saying the, the same thing. I think I agree with you. And so the way, I, way that I think of it is uh, in terms of a sort of, you know, Markov chain mm -hmm. of, of probabilistic events. The molecule, even at zero force, has some likelihood of entering into the strongly bound state. Mm -hmm. And the likelihood scales roughly with loading rate. Mm -hmm. um, and so it might take, you know, depending on how you model the on rate, it might take 10,000 tries for, say, the alpha catenin to bind to F actin under a slow loading rate and 100 at a higher loading rate. Theoretically, it should go logarithmically in the loading rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're always trying to get kinetic data on how the complex behaves. And so we tend to gravitate towards experiments where we can actually see binding. Um, but you're reminding me that it's actually trivial to do experiments that make sure that what you and I are hypothesizing is really true. That's pretty easy. Um, so my students might like an easy experiment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. I th we, there's a bunch of questions, but I think we'll do one more quick one now and then save some for the mm -hmm. informal discussion. So, so Margaret Cardell mm -hmm. asked if the structure of these actin binding domains are known, and are there any common mm -hmm. features that would predict the asymmetry and the force dependence? Yeah, thanks. Uh, first off, Margaret, thanks for coming. It's good to see your face. And second, um, yes, actually. So Bill uh, just published a really nice eLife paper simultaneously with a nice, equally nice paper from Greg Aleutian's lab. And these thatch domains have this really clever structure. It's a five helix bundle and it binds sort of okay to F actin. But then when you peel off one of the helix, the N terminal helix, the remaining four helices repack and they get much nicer on F actin. And the distance parameter that you get for peeling off that helix is actually reasonably consistent with our kinetic modeling, which is kind of gratifying. So yeah, I think we have a pretty good lock on how this thing works at a molecular level now. <laughs> 